Hi all, my name is Celine Coggins. I'm the Executive Director of Grant Makers for Education. And you are here for a very special conversation, one that I am very excited about myself. Uh, so our topic today is what funders need to know about school reopening. <laughs> and uh, I am really honored to have the two guests that I would pinpoint right now as the two most important national leaders in our school reopening and back to school conversations. So we have Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, and we have Becky Pringle, who is the newly elected president of the National Education Association. Both of these organizations uh, represent basically all of the teachers in America. Um, they are deep in the weeds in conversations that touch every single community in America right now, every single student, and they are in deep contact with every single teacher. And so for those of you in the funder community who want to be helpful, who want to support school reopening and the needs of our students and the needs of our teachers, uh, these folks are uniquely positioned to help us understand what we can do. Uh, I know that lots of funders are trying to find entry points to help in this crazy, intense, and really hard to understand moment. And so our leaders are here today to help us with sense making, help us think about entry points. And we know that for many of you, uh, you know, it's looking beyond the day-to-day -day supportive basic needs that so many have you, of you have done throughout this pandemic to thinking about systemic strategies, systemic change, really addressing deep inequities that exist in our education system. And so we have two people today who are also very interested in those issues. Um, I think this will be fascinating because we get to ask the two uh, union presidents what they did on their summer vacation, and I can imagine <laughs> that it has been uh, really, really interesting <laughs> and that they have a lot to say. So, uh, so this is a chance to hear from them. This is not a chance to debate back to school uh, plans. We know that everyone has different opinions. We know that every person in America is dying for kids to go back to school in person. And we know that we're in the midst of a failed public health crisis. We know we have a secretary of education who is absent on the job. And so, uh, so this is a chance to kind of listen to people who are in the arena, uh, ask questions and try to figure out some synergies. So with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, first to Randy, I believe, for just some opening remarks. Thank you, Celine. And um, yeah, as you said that, I would say that I spent my summer, I, I spent every day since April trying to figure out how to reopen schools. And last week in between, or this week in between, you can, you can see the crunch time because in between the Democratic Convention, most of my day on Wednesday, was on Zooms and conference calls and meetings with members or the press on five different places on reopening. Um, and, you know, and I think, so let me, let me just say this. We're, you know, I'm, it's great to have, I love Lily Garcia Eskelson, but it's great to have Becky as a new partner. She also brings some fresh eyes onto this because she has been mired, she's been mired in it, but she hasn't been mired in every single moment of it. And I'm really, really delighted that we, with that, you know, of the work that we've done together. And she brings a really fi a fixation on equity, which is absolutely imperative here. I start on the issue of safety because that's where my career at the UFT, which is where I was before I was the AFT president, I was the UFT president before that, I actually helped start the UFT health and safety department in you know, the period of time when the dinosaurs roamed, as I say, in the 1980s. And schools were in dilapidated conditions then. And most of the time, you know, teachers, and parents and administrators figure it out regardless of what's going on. But they can't figure it out regardless of what's going on during a pandemic. And you saw that people did the best they could by closing schools and did this Herculean um, attempt to stand up remote learning, um, feeding programs, all the digital stuff. I would say that the things that were hardest 
for us to get any cooperation with, with the powers that be were on connectivity, not on getting machines, but the cable companies are not great on giving connectivity to all the people who need it, even where you have tremendous broadband. But let me kind of go to where we are right now, which is we really want schools to reopen. Most, <coughs> excuse me, most schools will not reopen in any of a normal that is recognizable to anyone. Meaning that you can go through a kind of list that and and that everybody now I hope has, um, which should have been obvious in April, but is now becoming obvious um, to parents and teachers as we reopen schools and where there's now a consensus about how, you know, six out of 10 people think that we need to be in remote, but 80% of the people think, you know, if you look at the Paul Peterson study, that health and safety comes first. So they're not buying the Trump, DeVos, open at any cost, the risk, who cares about the risk, teachers and kids are, are dispensable. And with every time that something happens, um, people get more and more fearful. So we have complete, we have a lot of chaos. We have a lot of consternation. I say it in a non-hyperbolic way because what I have found helpful is to really, as a social studies teacher and as a lawyer, is to really listen to the scientists and the doctors. And we have charted out as a result how to open. And this is what we've learned as of this week much of this, many of you have heard me say this before, and then I'm going to get to what I think you can do. Number one is that community spread issue is really important. In the South, the West, as you see community spread go up, the doctors will tell you as we start moving wholesale inside again, this is how a spike started happening in the South and the Southwest by bars and restaurants open opening. Now we're starting to move um, schools inside. That is the biggest movement inside probably since the COVID started. And virtually any doctor who's calling balls and strikes in this field will tell you there is going to be positivity because of that. And the real issue becomes what is a outbreak versus what is a surge. And that's what happened in terms of the South and the West. So looking at that number all the time is really, really, really important. But that gets to the second thing, which was the hallmark in the UFT plan about how to reopen New York City schools. And this, again, you hear people say testing, tracing, isolation, but it's hard to understand what that means. South Korea had a national strategy of basically testing, tracing, isolation, not temperature testing, but the swabs or the this or the that, because what we've learned, A, kids carry, not just adults, and much of it these days is asymptomatic. So before, so, they, so, so if you don't have a robust system, and what UFT has suggested is that everyone gets tested as a baseline, and that if you get the antibody tests, we now know that that is pretty much a good um, antibody for a couple of months. But if you don't, it's a routine test. And then third, all of the what I call the big six, which even the CDC still says you need, and ultimately, because they have to, and ultimately, we need the funding for it, which is the um, physical distancing, the hand washing, the um, you know, the, the ventilation, the cleaning, reasonable accommodation, and, um, um, and obviously masks. The reason I say all of these things is that, say we had the money to hire double the amount of teachers and to get all the tents we needed in the world and all the, you know, classroom space, we could open full time in places where you could do the testing, you had these safeguards, and you had community spread um, below 5%. But no one has had those kind of all of that together. If you had all that together, as my members saw it, said it to me in June, 
76% said that they wanted to be back in school if they had those safeguards because they know that that's important. The reason I go through all this is because at the end of the day, it's gonna be the science, it's not gonna be our feelings about what reopen schools and when schools get reopened. And because of what Trump and DeVos did, they made it worse, not better. So many, many more places are, are, being, are do, being done in remote rather than in school, I think because of their attitude and because of the recklessness and the lack of resources. So it is, to borrow an overused expression, it's not woulda, shoulda, coulda, this is the situation we have. So what do we do about it? Four quick things. We need to work together to make remote better. Even in a hybrid situation, we're gonna have remote, we're gonna have remote for a long time. We need to, and, and, and I'm one who really wants groups and vulnerable kids to get together if it's safe, if we can do it. We're gonna to have to learn how to do pods better. We're gonna to have to learn how to do tutoring better. We're gonna to have to learn how to do remote better. We're gonna to have to learn how to use the screens better how much time, what curriculum works, and we really need some help in doing that. Share my, I mean, um, our innovation fund is putting out a million dollars to get best practices or practices from our members to try to figure out what worked, what didn't work, things like that, and we're putting money out for that, but we really need some help with others in terms of how to do this. Number two, community schools. Well-being is huge. We can put stand up community schools, whether we are remote or whether we are not, which is wrapping services around, making sure we pull. Obviously we need nurses, we need guidance counselors, but we need to pull the services around so that we know our kids, we know our families, we know how to reach them. And a community school process can do that right now. Number three, we need to make our school cafeterias robustly think about school cafeterias as feeding the village, not just feeding the kids. And, and that takes money, World Central Kitchen, all the feeding groups, we are really part of trying to figure out how to do this, but we need to do more than grab and goes, particularly in light of the um, exhaustion of the care relief on unemployment and on, um, and on evictions and whatever. We really need to make those kitchens roar all the time. And we know the safety things about how to do that. And the last thing we need to do is we actually need to make sure we need to do a kick in the pants to the cable companies and the broadband. Yes, it'd be great to have broadband in lots of different places, but frankly, there's broadband in a lot of different places and we need to make connectivity for free for all families. It needs to be like radio waves. These are things that we need to do right now to actually make sure that the things that we need to do for kids and the engagement gets better at the moment, regardless of what happens safety-wise. Super helpful. Um, this is great. And I want to, as I turn things over to Becky, say that certainly nationally, as well as in a number of locales that I've been trying to be uh, watchful of, it's been remarkable, the level of alignment and coordination between the NEA and AFT, so I applaud you for that. Uh, Becky, I say that to tee you up because I'm sure you have some similar things to say, but you are the fresh set of eyes. So um, give us a little bit of your experience coming into this role and uh, you know what is top of mind for you and where you see things going this fall. So uh, thank you, Celine. Um, can you hear me okay? Celine? Yes. <laughs> Oh, okay. I, yeah, I'm never sure. Did I unmute it? Um, okay. So first of all, uh, Celine, thank you for inviting uh, me to join you this afternoon. And I'm really, I'm really um, glad and hopeful. We talked about that word, right? Um, that you're at the helm. Um, uh, because um, uh, your experience, your partnership with us, both NEA and AFT throughout the years, I think it's going to bring a lot of wisdom and, and expertise. Um, and connections uh, that will actually have this body of folk uh, make some really, really good decisions. So good afternoon to everyone that has joined us. Uh, thank you for inviting me and the NEA to join you in this, what I'll call um, exploration of how Grantmakers for Education can use collective insights and share resources and constructive collaboration to actually guide your decisions about how to make more intentional and impactful investments 
so you can help to demonstrate uh, what the power of networks can, can be, what it looks like, what it can do in affecting that greater change that we're all uh, uh, searching for. So um, as uh, Celine indicated, I am the president-elect of the largest labor union in this country, uh, fresh after a week or so. I am, uh, but, at, but at my core, I'm an eighth grade science teacher from Pennsylvania. I taught those babies with attitude. Uh, in the in the wonder years, and they, and they were uh, they were wonderful. <laughs> you know, I bring with me the voices and expertise, the ideas and the accomplishments of three million educators, teachers, and and the other adults who have dedicated their lives to supporting the learning uh, for the students uh, in America. As a science teacher, you know, I always spent my summers learning about and and creating new experiences to spark that natural curiosity that, that the kids have about the wonders of their physical world. I was always eager and excited to start that new school year. It's just like a fresh start every year. It's full of a lot of hope and anticipation. But this new school year, um, educators are starting with confusion and the chaos that Randy described so vividly. And, and let me say a minute, let me stop a minute and, and acknowledge, Celine, what you said. NEA and AFT have been aligned from the start, not only because it's the, we're, we're speaking the truth and we're saying what's right for our students, but we understand as organizations how important it is to be partners in this, that our collective voice brings power and it is in this moment that we need to exercise that power. So I, I thank you, Randy, for being uh, such a great partner. And I would remind folks, you know, as we talk about examples, the examples that will lift up both of us that Randy has already lifted up, that in the, our larger uh, affiliate, local affiliates uh, from Los Angeles to New York to Miami-Dade in Florida, that uh, we are in merged states, so we share the same members. So we're working in collaboration, literally, uh, because we're, we, we have um, uh, those merged states and merged locals. So I just wanted to, to say that. Thank you, uh, Randy, for your kind words. And, and I'm glad that, um, you know, whenever we appear in the same space, <laughs> whichever one of us starts, then I feel a need to say, okay, just what Randy said, then let's move on. Uh, because you hit all of those points. And I'll, I'll, I'll hit them again, maybe some of them for emphasis and raise a few others, but, but we are absolutely aligned. So when she talked about that chaos and the uncertainty and the fear, that's how our educators are starting the school year and our students and our parents. Um, and they are angry. They're angry that in far too many cases, educators are called to choose. And these are false choices between continuing uh, employment in some instances, and the safety of their students and their families and their, themselves and their colleagues. And as this country grapples with how it's going to handle this coronavirus, while it's also being called to account for the systemic racial and social injustices that have existed in this country since its beginning, since its birth, our NEA members are, are refusing to stay silent. You know, we will make sure that our school boards and our governors, our members of Congress know that we must follow hey, those health experts, that, that advice that Randy laid out on how we reopen our schools and, and our institutions of higher education. And, and we're insisting that they listen to and collaborate with educators on how best to educate our students in a way that is safe and that is equitable. We're doing everything, everything in our power to ensure that our students are safely educated during this pandemic. Um, earlier this summer, uh, much like AFT, we put out a guidance which we called All Hands on Deck, and we did that deliberately. Because here's the thing, we can't, we can't do this by ourselves. Not, not only can't we, but we don't want to. We, we at the NEA talk a lot about uh, steeping our vision in what we call shared responsibility because we cannot do it alone. Part of the reason that's true is because all of the social systems impact what happens in education. You know, if, if our students are hungry, they can't learn. If they're suffering from economic or, or, or housing injustice, um, if they're living, living in food deserts, they can't learn. If they don't have access to healthcare, they can't learn. So all of those systems impact what happens in our classroom. So we have to have all hands on deck. It, this cannot be solved by educators alone. We have to have everyone at the table talking together, 
creatively solving these problems. Um, and so we, as we developed that guidance, we knew that we needed to develop it not only to assist our educators, but to assist our families and, and our allies, our community leaders and policymakers, all from the school board to the White House, not that anyone in the White House is listening, but um, so that we could focus on health, uh, um, the health expertise and educator and family voice as part of our decision making so that we could have access to all of those, those things that Randy laid out, so that our students could, could um, so that our students could go back to school safely. And, and, and most importantly, that we're leading with equity, so that racial and social and uh, social and economic and educational justice actually becomes a reality. As I met with thousands, that's, I guess the, I don't want to call this good news, but we, 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 we leaned into the opportunity of Zooming all around the world. Uh, Randy and I weren't on planes flying all over the place like we usually are. So it actually gave me an opportunity to meet with thousands of members all over this country and around the world actually, uh, to talk with them, but mostly to listen. And one thing was clear, and they were very, 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 very um, adamant about this, that they needed help. They needed help as professionals working in this new virtual environment. They needed help on how to be even stronger advocates and activists to be able to demand that their students have what they need so they could learn in a safe and equitable environment. And then they also needed help as humans because our educators are struggling just like everyone else. They're trying to take care of their families. They're trying to figure out how they stay healthy. They are dealing with trauma themselves. They're dealing with the loss of being with their students. They're dealing with a li literally actual loss of family members. Um, and, and they're trying to, trying to learn how to take care of themselves even as they try to take care of others. So, so those are the th three things that really jumped up, up for us. So we started reaching out to our affiliates, to our members themselves and to our affiliates um, and to our allies and partners to, to provide information and resources uh, to provide support for educators and for parents and policymakers at our one-stop site, which we call Educating Through Crisis. Um, and then we're also uh, working directly with our educators, uh, with them, um, so that we're developing and creating uh, webinars with them and for them on how to engage uh, in digital, engage our, our learners in digital lessons, uh, how to connect with families at this moment. Our, so many parents are reaching out late at night saying, I don't know how to help support you in teaching them this math that makes no sense to me. So we're doing that. Uh, we're also uh, really leaning into our responsibility to support them in, in the social emotional learning of our students, as well as sharing ideas on how to make um, our, our environment better uh, this fall. We partner with our PBS affiliate to, to make sure age appropriate lessons are available to families, particularly without, with, without those families that don't have that reliable access to digital tools or, or the internet. Um, we partnered with states um, like uh, in our affiliate in Colorado to make sure that there are resources for English language learners and we work with special, special education um, educators and parents to make sure we have resources on, on instruction to take into consideration things like what's called universal design for learning principles. How do we apply that in a digital, in a digital uh, space? What kind of platforms do we need to ensure that we have um, access to closed captioning, for example, making font sizes larger. So those are kind of things that we've been wrestling with and working on and solving uh, with together. And then we've also been working with civic organizations, civil rights organizations um, and civic groups, because we know that we have to address this from that racial and social justice lens. We have to center our work in that. Um, and so as we think about how the, the reality that COVID has hit indigenous and black and brown communities hardest, how do we purposefully resource um, those uh, communities in a way that not only stands in those gaps right now, but we've got to be able to lift up our heads and make decisions in this moment for what we want to create, that aspirational vision of what we want it to be, because the reality is our, our public system was never equitable especially based on race, especially based on socioeconomic status, especially based on ability. And so as we are creating solutions now, we have to think about the impact as we move toward the future. Um, here's the thing. We know that this administration has, um, its response has ranged from none to anemic to too little too late. Educators are being blamed and bullied and threatened and our students are paying the price. 
all at a time that we know that we know we must do better as we work to try to solve these structural compounding systems uh, that are, are producing the inequities throughout throughout our systems. Public schools, we know this, we know this, and we believe this. They are a common good. They are the foundation of this democracy. And we've got to figure out how we transform them into racially and socially just and equitable systems that are actually designed to ensure that every student, every one of them, is prepared to succeed in a diverse and interdependent world. So that's what we're focused on. And we know how incredibly important it is to have partners like the ones that have joined us today to try to figure that out. I wanna leave you with this. Um, one of the things that we work really hard to do at the NEA is to listen to our students. And so we actually um, uh, convened uh, or, or um, commissioned a couple of our, our, our poets, our student poets, uh, to do uh, some, some work for us. And uh, it resulted in this incredible, which I'd love to share with you, just incredible collection of, of poet, poetry from our, from our students. And what they said to us, we have one, one of our students that, that spoke to us, her name, her name was, was Nisha. And as she talked to us um, about the marginalization based on race and, and LGBTQ status, um, and economic status. As she talked up to us about, you know, the growing school to prison pipeline, the implicit bias that exists in our, in our school systems. Um, she described the challenges that she faces as a young person and trying to find her way to get the support and encouragement, the resources and respect she needed to live into her brilliance. Nisha ended her, her, her pointed poet, poem with this question, do you hear me? Do you hear me? She wanted to know that her teachers and paraprofessionals or counselors and custodians heard her. And we promised her that we did. We hear our students when they tell us that they know, they know. We, you know, some people think they don't know, but they know that because of the color of they, their skin, they will suffer from institutional racism that impacts their schools and communities throughout a country that's still grappling with the sins of a homeland stolen and slavery and internment. So I wanna let you know that at the NEA, we will not rest until every one of our students is safe and supported, valued and respected. We will not rest until they know that we not only hear them, but that we will fight to ensure that the society sees their humanity and does what we must so they truly, they truly are free. I am looking forward to a partnership with you so that you can help us make it so. Celine? Thank you so much, Becky. That was super helpful and really compelling. Um, I appreciate both of you and I'm going to turn to a few questions that both of you can weigh in on. I also want to encourage folks to uh, use the chat and throw questions in there. Uh, we already have one. So this Becky is just a quickie follow up for you. Um, an acknowledgement that um, some families don't have access to PBS and are you doing anything with local access TV stations um, on that tack to make sure there are lessons available that way. Absolutely, our affiliate in New Jersey kind of came out of the came out of the box with that early on in April, and many of our affiliates have been partnering with them and learning how they were doing it. So they absolutely um, are doing that. And uh, what's what's really good about that it happened there is that they had actually already started that partnership years ago, like I want to say almost 20 years ago. And so they had that partnership in place, which is really pretty critical. They already had that. They had a series called Pla Classroom Matters. And so they immediately reached out and they said, how can we bring these lessons? How can we co-create them so that they are age specific? And how can we put them online in a way that our parents uh, and, and our students and educators are able to access them? And so we've seen that replicated all throughout the country. Excellent. And Randy, I'm going to turn back to you and your four points. Um, one of them was the notion of kind of internet access for everyone. Internet should be like radio waves, which I think is an awesome sentence that everyone should be able to repeat and repeat to their congressional leaders and state leaders. Um, are there entry points for um, 
members who are interested in that issue specifically, and we'll get into some of the others, um, what would you advise folks to do? Really, um, you know, most of my questions are going to orient around, you know, what, sh what should funders be doing to help move these issues forward? So I think on the, um, on the internet uh, issues or the connectivity issues, there's an advocacy piece that we have not been as successful about as we should on both a local and, and national level, which is, um, and I don't mean it this way, but I mean it this way. We have to shame the, these companies, Spectrum, Verizon, Optimum. They can, they can make this, they're, they're, the, the waves are already, the, the, the broadband is there. They don't have to make money on this right now. They can give a basic package that if you have children, um, you know, if you have children, you get a basic package of Wi-Fi for free and period. And that, yes, we are trying to get money from the HEROES Act to do this. And it would be great if they actually used their lobbying, their CEO lobbying that they used when they needed money from for PPP, excuse me. That would be great if they helped us. But I think we have to force it on a local level. And that would be a good advocacy piece to do uh, because the hotspots are not going to really, I mean, they work, but they're not going to really work. So that's number one. Number two, though, is there's lots of people who are trying to figure out, like we, we just contributed, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 hotspots in different places. We are doing all sorts of stuff which, with uh, First Book to make sure that, that kids have books to read that are, that are not just age appropriate, but really deal with social emotional trauma issues and that um, have the appropriate um, focus on diversity. Um, and so First Book is a really good group to partner with to do this. We, we did this with a few homeless shelters um, in New York and in other places throughout the country. Um, but, but the other piece is even spending um, the, these, that we need to get really good curricular frameworks into people's hands so that and that are really different than what happens in classrooms. Working with the mo remote education is different than in-person education. And so to the extent that some of the funders on this phone can actually help um, create grants so that we can get groups of teachers together to do this so that they're not doing it you know, just for free or, or get people together and consortiums together like we did with our capstone projects like Linda Darling Hammond has suggested again. There, there's a lot of deep work one can do as well as the research work. So from advocacy to the work of how do we build it? Because we have to, the, if we don't, last year was just a matter of grit and ingenuity. We, we did not, use, the, the summer, the fixation on the summer was taking out the ruler to figure out what's six feet and to see if windows open or not. The fixation in the summer should have been like, let facilities people figure that out. The fixation on the summer for, for non-facilities people were, how do we actually make remote and hybrid work? And I don't think we've done enough on that. Yes, this is the drum that I've been beating as well. It's uh, heartening to hear you say that, but I think it's incredibly important. Um, I want to continue on this topic just for a moment. And Becky, anything more that you would want to add on this topic of helping teachers become good at remote learning. I was teaching a graduate school course this, this spring that went, you know, one day it was in person, the next day it was remote and I was terrible. It's a completely <laughs> different thing. <laughs> so I have a tremendous amount of empathy for teachers who are doing it 
you know, six and seven hours, five days a week. Um, what, what are you doing? What do you need to make sure that teachers are able to make this monstrous transition? So I completely agree with Randy. It's one of the things that I've been saying uh, for the last couple of weeks. It's, it is extraordinarily frustrating for educators that we spend so much time on these false arguments and the discussions over and over again. Will we open? Won't we open? We already said you need either provide it or let's get ready for remote learning because that's what's going to come. Who are we kidding? You know, until we get a vaccine, that's what's going to happen. So why don't we all just stop wasting our time and focus on what Randy just said. And that, then I would add this. Um, so just like you said, Celine, who, who, who was taught to do that? I know I was not. So we have to think about how we redesign our professional development. So not only do we need to develop the, the resources, the curriculum and all of that, but we have to uh, provide the space and the time for the development of educators. And by the way, and I really wanna emphasize this, it's not only teachers, and we saw that in a big way. It is our paraprofessionals. It's our, it's, it's our other adults in that system that support the learning. So we've got to figure all of that out. And now we have new partners in our parents, in our grandparents. And so what does that look like? What does that partnership look like? What kind of training do we need to provide for them as well? Um, but we have to think differently about, about the training. And then another thing I want to really emphasize, um, and, and over, <laughs> as you described it, you know, we went out in an instant and we just used, what, we do what we always do. We do what we always do. We rose to the occasion, we heroic efforts, you know, put our, literally put our lives on the line to try to ensure that our students had resources, they were fed and they and their families were fed and all of those things happened. Um, but that's, you know, that's that, that's that kind of urgent, you know, staying in that urgent important quadrant all the time, instead of lifting your head up and saying, okay, what are we planning for the future? That's not going to work. We know that. This is going to be with us for, for a long time. And so in addition to that, we need to think about how we're doing it. And one of the things we know is that we've got to collaborate on this work. And so the last thing I want, to, the, the last thing I want our funders to, to do is to go away from this discussion and hear, oh, yeah, okay, well, let me, let me, yeah, I heard, I heard Becky say that we need professional development, so let me go partner with somebody to do that. No, no, let me listen and let me provide the space and the opportunity for educators to work on creating that themselves. And it needs to be continuous. So some of the schools that went out quickly in the fall, actually because they had the systems and the processes and structures that were built in, especially our community schools that Randy lifted up, especially them, uh, they already understood what needed to be in place. And so the superintendents in those schools said, you know what, we are not gonna, we're not gonna be in front of our kids for a week. We're gonna come together in this space. We're gonna learn together. We're gonna figure out what we need, what gaps are there. And that, and we're gonna, then we're gonna come, we're gonna learn uh, uh, what we don't know. And we're gonna try to get, have you uh, have some development before you're in front of your students. So they actually gave them ch a chance to do that. When, as we go back, that needs to be built in, that opportunity to continue to learn and to co-create and to, to collaborate in ways that we are actually leveraging the expertise, that collective ex expertise of our educators. So that's absolutely essential. As the grant members think about how they can leverage the money that they are investing in our schools, think about the systemic kinds of ways that we can not only solve this problem right now, but actually um, build some systems and structures that will live on even when we come back to face-to-face -to -face learning. Really helpful. Exactly. So now you have both uh, tackled in different ways the issue and importance of community schools. So I think that the one thing that we can say of the spring that the experience of the spring lifted up is how central schools are in supporting the basic needs of many of our students. So food insecurity, shelter, uh, a safe place to be. So as we move from this moment and think toward the future, think systemically, there's a, an increased role arguably for community schools. Uh, Randy, you pointed to this and then indirectly, Becky, you just point, pointed to this. Um, how should funders be thinking systemically about the the role for community schools in the future of schooling. You want me to start or you want Becky to start? Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Randy. So I also, I just wanna go back to something, Becky prompted me to think about something 
one of the conversations I had um, in the spring, which was one of the, for me, one of the most illuminating, it was with several teachers on different levels who had just gone through three months of, uh, of, of this kind of remote education. And the kind of best practices, I mean, again, nothing is really a best practice yet because mm -hmm. we're still kind of learning a lot, but what their comfort levels were based upon, you know, how they got through the oh shit moments, how they got through their own, like, you know, I don't even know how to turn on the computer, much less use it for Zoom or Google Classrooms or whatever, but um, how to, what was the role for asynchronistic teaching versus the role of um, everyone together? How, how, not only how long on a, on a, on a screen, but um, how do you reach kids who are not on the screen? How do you group kids? And, and, and there was a lot of learning that, the, that what Becky just said about the professional development right now is so important. Nobody's really gotten to download that in a very kind of system basis. And that's why I think what Massachusetts did and a couple of other districts now of basically having the first week of really kind of creating community themselves, downloading the experience, whether, and, and some people are going to be in schools doing this in schools and, and, and that helps overcome the fear and some people are not, I would actually advise that nobody mandates anybody to do, to be in any particular place. But, but that, that is gonna be really important in terms of creating the baseline and creating the community. And that extends to then also community schools. The other thing I didn't say, which I think should be obvious, is the most important thing we need to do is fight the virus and mm -hmm. fight and do the mitigation, the containment strategies as we're trying to get to a, a, a vaccine. But you can, but that is a community, that's community work and that's regional work. And so I would actually say there's a lot of great community schools now. Some of them are funded, some of them are not. But the system that they put into place base, is based upon three things. Number one, creation of a community, meaning that, that people see that the school is more than just what you instruct. And that there is, a, there is some kind of needs assessment about what kids and what families need. So the creation of a community with a needs assessment. Number two, bringing in and mapping where people have some both power and um, resources in a community. Because even now, even with all the cuts that have happened, there are still resources that we need to kind of integrate into the schools and families should know that the school can be a hub even if it's being remote. And number three is to actually make all of this stuff happen. So it's do the needs assessment, do the mapping of who has what, where in a region. And then three, regardless of whether we have resources now or not, create the hub to make it happen to the extent we can. Helpful. Becky, do you wanna add on this topic of community schools and what funders can do to be supportive? Right. So the first thing I want to want to say is, you know, I, what I don't want to, to happen, which happens so much in education, because anyone who ever went to school thinks they know what's best for our, for our, for our schools and for our students. Um, it's shocking, right, Celine? Shocking. Um, uh, and these are people in positions of power and authority. Um, but what I don't want, want uh, the, the folks that are gathered here today to, to go away uh, from this and think about community schools is that it's, it's the next shiny ball. And if we just you know slap that name on it, not that I'm saying our funders would do that, but we're seeing that, Randy and I are seeing that throughout the country, you know, the, that um, those edgy vultures that I call them are trying to find the next best thing to make money. So no, 
Um, uh, at the NEA, we actually um, uh, uh, spent time working with our educators many, many years and doing a lot of research. And we ended up with what we call our six pillars. And these are the, these are the kinds of things that we focus on when we collaborate with our locals and our states to, to actually build community schools. And they include strong and proven culturally relevant curriculum. It includes high quality teaching and learning. It includes inclusive leadership, which is a piece that a lot of people miss um, and, they, and they misunderstand or they don't prepare themselves enough for. And that includes uh, from the school board to the superintendent and to the teachers and other educators themselves. They also need to know how to be leaders in this space. Uh, positive uh, behavior practices. We talk a lot about restorative uh, justice practices, family and community partnerships, um, and then finally a coordinated and, a, and an integrated um, uh, support services that actually view our students as as the whole people, the whole students, the, the whole student they are. And what we talk about with the community schools is that when you build those systems, processes, and structures from the beginning, then when you're in a crisis like this one. And, I, and I, I'll certainly provide some additional information if you want it, but one of the things I asked, because I had a theory on this case, um, while we were in the middle of this whole thing, like the, you know, the start of the summer, I said, you know, our community schools must be doing better than, than most other schools. And so I asked our staff to, to, do, to, to pull them together and have a conversation and talk with them about what's going on in the throes of COVID-19 with them. And the theory that I had proved to be true, that they were doing so much better because they already had these processes in place. And so when we think about that whole student and that whole, whole family and community schools being the beacon of the community, the entire community, those students and families that needed healthcare, that needed access to testing, that needed uh, to ensure that they were doing things to keep themselves he healthy, they already had a partnership with their hospitals in that community. And so they opened up their doors and gave them access to that. They, are, they already were creating spaces where families and children could get fed. They had those food banks going right away. They already came together in their inclusive leadership model and they said, hey, you know what, we're not ready. We are not ready to teach remotely. So why don't we divvy this up? We'll break it up. You know, different people will take different age groups or different subject matters. And they came together as a community of educators and said, we will take on this part. We will take on that part. And then we'll share our learnings with each other. So they already had it. Um, uh, in place. So um, we, we talk with some of our educators at Lynn Middle School in, in, in New Mexico. And we also talk with some of our educators in um, the uh, Duarte High School in Los Angeles. And, and it was the cons those consistent themes came through. So I would say to, your, to the funders to dig into that and, um, and understand what happened and why, because what we need to identify is those criteria that are successful. And we saw success in our community schools. That's great. Um, relatedly, I had a question about um, out of school time. So there's less of an infrastructure for the many support programs that exist within schools, but often at the end of the day or the before school time. Uh, are you all doing anything with those groups that have less of an infrastructure, but are essential to meeting students needs across a full day? Um, I, I'll say I'm I, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and one of the things that we've talked with our affiliates about, we talked uh, uh, years ago about, and you saw that, you saw that on full display in our Red for Ed movement, and uh, that 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 swept the nation, is that you have to build partnerships, and we try to build those partnerships at the national level. We do, and we have. But what we say uh, to our state and our local affiliates is that you have to build strong and authentic partnerships within your communities. And so those who had done that work were able to reach out right away to the Boys and Girls Clubs and the YMCAs um, and other organizations that were uh, not only designed to meet the needs uh, in many cases of our most vulnerable students, but also their families. And, and this was another thing I wanted to hit on. And, and we're, we're struggling with this, Celine. Um, because here's the reality, as more and more, and you know this, more and more of our, our schools are making the decision to put safety first and they're starting remotely because their infection rates are not down, they've not gotten the funding they need to provide all of the, the, the things that Randy uh, talked about. Um, they're realizing that their parents are struggling, they're trying to work, they may be essential workers that have to go back to work and what are they doing? 
And so we are trying to partner with those community organizations to figure out some solutions for our parents as well, um, as they're struggling with, with going back to work and as they're struggling with supporting the learning of their students. So that's a group of folks that we're really working hard with to try to identify their needs. And, and, and as, you're, as the funders are thinking about the, the, the uh, things that they want to really lean into, that is a huge need. Uh, and we'd love to partner with them on that. Randy, do you want to say anything more about this kind of overlapping space between what used to be considered out of school time? Um, there are different funding streams. There's a question in the chat about, you know, how are you thinking about alignment? How are we thinking about, you know, kind of traditional teachers plus the out of school time and making the most of the limited resources we have um, in that space? So I, um, so I agree with, with, everything Becky just said, I think that the, um, the lack of childcare right now um, and the inequities on childcare, on pod tutoring, on things like that are just bracing. And um, so part of the, the so, so, you know, we've been supporting all of the childcare bills. Um, we actually represent um, a, a bunch of child care providers in and as does ask me and SEIU, you know that that um, became providers in the aftermath of welfare reform and the TANF funding and thinking about how to try to coordinate with them coordinate with after the after school alliance and others. Um, all of this system-wide, I mean, all these partnerships are really important, but the reason I am actually very focused on a community school model is because I think you can patch that, you can put that all together in that kind of model, as opposed to having, this is the boys and girls partnership here, and this is the Y partnership here, and this is this one here, all, all of that is going to happen anyway, but we need to have a little, some economies of scale and some best practices in terms of doing some of this. The rec centers in New York were some of the most, um, uh, some of the, the best ways of taking care of first responders kids during the height of COVID. They need to be, they, they've continued, but we need to not only stand them up, but expand them and I also think that we need to think about how to do um, what Israel and other um, countries in Europe did, which was, um, sorry, someone is trying me. It's not surprising that you're getting a call. <laughs> what, a, what a shock. No, that's the, that's the end of the, uh, the, the hearing just ended in, um, the hearing just ended in Florida. So those are the lawyers calling me to tell me what happened. So um, <laughs> my apologies for looking at my, uh, but, but they're, uh, they're, they're, they're now waiting for a decision. But the, um, so, so that's why I'm, you know, trying to figure out what's the funding models, because I agree with Becky that when we talk to people, the people who already have those programs stood up and that infrastructure stood up, um, were able to make the right, were able to actually advance these issues of childcare and aftercare and after school and, um, you know, the use of pod tutoring. I mean, a lot of people call it different things, but on and on. And, and that's why I'm, some system approach would be helpful here because people feel so alone and and we need and the and those who have the least resources are the ones who have many times the most needs so a system approach growing out of the school um, would actually get more communication to a parent who is most at need um, and then, then, you know, frankly, us, my, you know, my wife and I being able to say, oh, let's see, the Metropolitan Opera is having this amazing 
you know, week of online after school and or this summer, let's just sign somebody up. So that's so, you know, that is a that's a white privilege opportunity that we need to essentially ensure every one of our, you know, little kiddos have. Really helpful. Well, and, I'm I mean, going to Celine, go ahead. I just want to add something to what Randy said. Um, there's, a, there's a tenet in community schools that I really want to lift up, and it, it ties to your question that you asked, uh, what we call uh, a mechanism, and that is a, doing a needs assessment. Um, that's the way you, you integrate all of it. You don't go in, any of us, go into a community and say, this is what you need to do. No. You go in and help, you provide technical assistance, funding, those kinds of things. But we've got to stop thinking of our, we've got to start thinking, let me say it in a positive way. We've got to start thinking about our communities as having assets. So often when we, we talk about marginalized communities and underserved communities, these are all true things, but it always engenders this negative context. And we never focus on the assets that are in those communities. And the community schools model is built on that. And so we need to create the space and provide the resources and support for the community to come together and to determine their own needs. So we, that's one of the basic tenets is to start right. with a needs assessment. So I just wanted and, to make sure that we do. And you know, I, I want to also, and I know we're running out of time, but I also want to build on what Becky also just said. In my neighborhood in New York, I live in Inwood, huge parks, some of the most beautiful parkland um, in the Northeast is um, right in Indian Woods and in Inwood. There, there were schools this summer who used that parkland in a way that had socially distant picnics, for families together, building community there, you know, but, but it was, they, they, the, there's, they, they have tremendous community connections because of, of what they've already done in the school. And then they use the assets that one had, even in New York city to actually create um, you know, spaces and moments and, and, and afternoons and evenings of joy. And, and that's the kind of asset that we have to think about in a pandemic, how to build community um, at a moment of great strife and, and, and great fear. Very helpful. Um, I think we're at time. <laughs> I have 110 more questions. <laughs> I think I'm going to contain myself from even asking the last one that I was dying to ask. Uh, I did want to close by saying to all of our members that both the AFT and the NEA have affiliated foundations that are members of GFE. Um, Sheetal Shah is on the call with the AFT Foundation and Sarah Sneed uh, with the NEA Foundation is on our board. And so if there are additional ways that you wanna connect with these organizations, please do and we can make those connections. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for your time. I know it's incredibly valuable, uh, both Becky and Brandy. Um, and thank you so much for just all of the leadership and hard work and challenging decision-making and um, just kind of being on the front lines and in the arena for all of us who care about public education. So thank you um, and good luck to you over the next month as more and more schools open around this country. And thank you to all of our members who joined us today.